Um, so, yeah, my name is uh, Richard Miller, and you can find me on Twitter at as Mr. Underscore, underscore R underscore Miller, which is a slightly awkward uh, Twitter thing that I didn't really realize how annoying it would be at the time of choosing it. So, I, uh, I work for Sensio Labs in the UK, so Sensio Labs UK, I'm based up in Sheffield, and before, sort of, like Sensio Labs and using sort of, uh, Symphony as sort of framework of choice a lot. I previously worked um, at a small company where we did something that quite a lot of people, I think, did back then, maybe still do to some extent, and accidentally made our own um, framework. And one of the things we found doing that, apart from that, you know, everyone else was doing a much better job of it, was it's quite difficult to be sort of writing code for one customer and then wanting to reuse a slightly different version of it somewhere else for another customer and sort of running into all kinds of problems about how to, you know, act, act, ending up maintaining multiple versions of it or having all sorts of kind of complicated code to work out which version of code we should be using for that customer. And you know, sort of finding out about dependency injection, how that worked, and that really helped me to start to sort out that code base. And at the time, it wasn't hugely popular inside as a technique that people used in the sort of PHP world, but sort of read about it in blogs and things from Java, where it was used a lot more extensively. Um, and then when we sort of came to our senses and realized that maybe we should be using one of these other great frameworks that are out there instead of per persevering with our own not so great one, um, it was one of the things that really sort of I liked about Symphony. Symphony so it was the Symphony 2, which we sort of started using, uh, well, started investigating and looking at when it was in a beta version. So, um, so what is dependency injection? So it's essentially a technique for, um, in object-oriented programming where we separate what objects we're actually going to use from how we use them so, and make that separation. So this is it pretty much. So in this example, we've got a class, a stock levels class, it needs to use, it has dependency on a notifier object that it's going to make use of. So instead of creating it inside the class, we inject it in through the constructor and then make use of it that way. So when we create a stop, instantiate <laughs> stock levels um, object, it needs a notifier and the constructor is going to force us to pass one in. Um, and we're separating that construction from the use of the notifier. And that's it, really. So, if you want to... So, and essentially that is all there is to the basic concept of dependency injection. Um, but I'm going to talk about sort of like why we do this and the advantages, but also where some of the complications arise from and why you've perhaps heard of sort of service containers and dependency injection containers and all these... There's lots of blog posts out about how you should and shouldn't do it. So, um, so why... Should we do it? I mentioned a little bit briefly, but if we go into a bit more detail, so for this, I'm going to use the example of uh, we've got a requirement that after we update the stock level of a product, we also need to email customers who ask to be notified about it. Presumably, I guess notified that something came back into stock, not just every change in stock level. Um, okay, so uh, first thing, we might create a lot of code, so we're going to update the stock level and then do all this stuff under there. I appreciate that's quite small, so if we split, um, because there's a lot of, sort of code going on there, so if we split up what's happening, and as I say, this is all happening after we've already kind of done the actual stock level updating, persisted that somewhere, then we're like, okay, we better notify those customers that wanted to be notified. So we're going to do it by email, so we set up our mailer object, so it's sort of very tedious sort of configuration code, and um, we're using SMTP, Here's the setting the address of the mail server, the port to use, the username and the password. Um, that's not my usual password. I don't have a usual password anyway. But, but <laughs> um, so we also need to do the same. So our customers we're getting from the database, this list of customers. Uh, we're using Doctrine for that in this case. So we need to configure, set up Doctrine. So tell it, um, in this case, we're just using SQLite. Um, probably don't want to use that for your production database, but uh, for the sake of conciseness in the examples. 
So we create an entity manager in that, and it gives us a repository, and now we can finally actually do something with this stuff. So we've got um, use the repository, ask it for customers that were registered for stock notification for that product ID. Then that gives us back a sort of group of, a collection of customers. We can loop through that collection of customers um, using for each in this case. For each one, we're going to create a message telling them about this that the products come back in stock. And then finally, we're going to use that mailer object that we created in the first slide there to send the message. <coughs> so the code we've created, well, that I created in this case, is quite inflexible. So there's a lot of hard-coded values in there, um, all the values for like usernames, password, where to find the server, the fact that we're using Swift Mail and the fact that we're using Doctrine. Um, it's also kind of reasonably complex to follow if you open a file and find that because you've kind of got to look at, read through the details of what's happening. You can see there's, there's a load of stuff around the mailer, a load of stuff around Doctrine, and finally we kind of get down to what we want to do. So what we could do to improve this is rather than um, just, you know, I split it across slides, but we could have actually split that into separate objects first, um, but I'll do that now. So if we split that up, so if we take our stock levels class, again, there's some other stuff happening before we get to this point, but instead of showing all that instantiation of um, Swift Mailer and Doctrine, we'll hide those inside, encapsulate it inside some objects. We've got an emailer object now and a customer's object, and then we can see that we're going to find all those customers and then notify them. So we've cut out some of that sort of things to read. Um, and abstracted away from it. So we'd end up with an emailer class, maybe like this, that hides that Swift mailer instantiation, and a customer's object, which hides the doctrine stuff and delegates to the doctrine repository. So say our stock level class looks like this, and it's a bit easier to read. We might find that though that actually um, that abstraction level might be even more detailed than we still really need to know. So what, all we really need to know if we're looking at the code updates for stock levels is that at that point we want to notify people that the stock levels have been updated. So we can simplify it right down to saying we have a notifier object that we're creating and we're going to notify people about the product. And then in that we shift that code that does the actual um, looping through the customers and sending the emails. So we kind of move that code from being sort of complex into something that's fairly simple, especially if, you know, at the level of looking at the stock levels, we, can, we now have two lines where we had sort of 30 or 40 before. So we're kind of simplifying each level of abstraction. We can see what's happening. It's only if we care exactly how it's happening that we then have to dig down and look at the code, source code for that class. So in terms of like following the path through the code, um, we simplify that quite a lot. It's still not dealt at all, though, it's, um, with any of the flexibility issues. So it's still all very hard-coded. Um, we're using hard-coded values a lot for the um, details, like the, where to find Swift mail, the mail server. Um, so like this is, well, to be honest, this code is going to be pretty difficult to work with, so even aside from trying to reuse it in another project, it's like if we want to have a developer environment, a staging environment, a UAT environment, and a production environment, hopefully they all point to different mail servers and things like this, so um, the first thing we could do, I guess, is we could have some kind of config object um, which we use static access to to get some parameter values, um, and that's going to maybe read in a different config file depending on which uh, environment we're in or which project it is. So we can kind of make it a little bit more flexible here, well, just usable at all because we're now um, able to set those values differently. <coughs> okay, so we've now got a requirement, so a different project maybe, they're going to not use email, we're going to use SMS messages to inform those customers um, that the things come back into stock. So what can we do to accommodate this in the code. We could use our config again, so we're asking our config object to 
tell us what the stock notification method is, and then we're going to, depending on the case of that in the switch statement here, we're going to call a different method. So if it's email, we'll notify by email. If it's SMS, we're going to notify by SMS. And then the sort of have these methods inside the in-stock notifier. So you can see we kind of made it a bit more extensible. <laughs> if we wanted to add another one there, we'd have to come in here, add another method, and actually add another case statement as well. Um, so yeah, and we're gonna have to constantly kind of come back in and edit this class. So we could maybe we could push that choice further up the class a bit. Um, well, further up the object graph a bit and say, instead of doing it in the notifier, we can maybe do that in the stock level. So in here we say, Okay, so if it's email, then we're going to use an email in stock notifier. And if it's SMS, we'll use a new SMS in stock notifier. So now we might have to create a new object to do that, but the only change we need to actually make to our existing code now is to kind of come in here and create a new case statement for that. Okay. So... We've made the code more flexible now. We can respond to different config values, and we can sort of have different paths through it depending on how we configure it, in this case, whether we want to use email or SMS. But we have started to grow the complexity back into it, so we've already got those sort of, we've got to talk to an extra config object. We've also got to kind of switch through the different values in that case, and we have to keep adding new cases to the switch statement if we want to support different methods of doing this. So if you're doing this throughout a code base, you can see kind of grow quite a bit of complexity in there. It makes facts of it being a bit more difficult to read. Um, there's more things going on than just making use of that object. <coughs> so what we can do then is use that sort of constructor injection I spoke about right at the start and say, when I create my stock level object, I'm just going to give it a fully formed already constructed notifier object. I'm going to set it to a private variable in this case, and then when we get to the point of updating stock levels, all we need to do is say notify people about this product update. So if we want to use emails, we instantiate it like this, with the email in stock notifier, and if we want to use it with SMS, then we can instantiate it like this and just use it with an SMS notifier. Um, in this example, it doesn't cope with the fact that maybe sometimes, you know, you might want to have email some customers and SMS some others, but let's just assume it's one or the other for the sake of this. Um, okay, so by using that sort of dependency injection, we're kind of saying, I don't want my, my object to instantiate its own dependencies and have to worry about what those dependencies are. I'm going to create them somewhere else, pass them in, ready formed, and the class can just say, just use the one that's there. It doesn't care which one it is. It just knows what it's going to do with them. And one of the other advantages is that we're making explicit how many things we're depending on. So if you end up kind of saying, well, I need this and this and this and this, and you've got this massive constructor that's growing and growing, and it highlights the fact that maybe that class is doing too much work itself, and maybe there's something else you could do to kind of simplify it and pass some of that work elsewhere. So there was a problem with that version now. So if we look back at this. So this is our simplified version. We're passing the notifier into the constructor and then we're calling the notify method. Fortunately, we could do this still when we're creating it and say, I'm going to want a new stock levels object and I'm just going to pass you some other object. It's not a notifier. And then I'm going to call update stock level on it and we're going to see this, unfortunately. So... It's a fatal error. We're getting a call to an undefined method because not a, the, our not a notifier object doesn't have a notify method to call. So we could say, well, we better make sure that when we construct our stock levels object that it is an email in stock notifier that we get. So we can check, use instance of is one way to say if it's an instance of email stock notifier, if it is, great, carry on. If it's not, we're going to throw an exception at this point. Fortunately, PHP makes that, uh, saves us writing some of that boilerplate code, and we can use type hints on the constructor to do that. So this time we're saying, we're insisting on an email in stock notifier. 
if I try and run this again, um, then I'll get a different error message this time. So now I'm saying it's a, it's a catchable fatal error, although I'm not sure anyone ever does catch them. But argument one passed to it must be an instance of email in stock notifier and instead an instance of not a notifier was given. So it doesn't necessarily help us if this, um, we're actually running this code in production, we still made a mistake, but it means that when you're doing something in development and you see, you get a much clearer error message that's much more explicit about what the problem was. It's not just that something didn't have a method, but you tried to give the wrong type of thing to something. And it kind of documents that code as well. So if someone's reading it, they can say, it needs an email in stock notifier, not just it needs a notifier, whatever on it. Well, you know, I've no idea what that is. Fortunately, if we do that with the concrete implementation of email in stock notifier and then say, actually, I want to use my SMS in stock notifier, we're going to get the same problem because it's not an email in stock notifier. So we've kind of like ruined that flexibility for the sake of a bit of safety. Okay, so we can solve this by using an interface and type hinting on that. So all we need is, so our interface just says, I'm something that, ha well, I'm a notifier, and I have a notify method. We can update the definitions of our email in stock notifier, our SMS in stock notifier, and any future notifiers that we add to say that they implement the in stock notifier. We'll get a fatal error then if we don't actually implement the, me the notify method when we try and create one of those. And then we can update our stock level class to type in on the interface and not on the concrete implementation. So now we know, we don't really know what that notifier is. We don't really, the stock level class doesn't care what it is. It just cares that when you pass me that object, I know you've got this, you, this interface, you have this method I can call. I can call it happily. It may just do nothing. Um, it might call out some sort of third-party service that helps us like send this stuff out by like traditional mail. Um, it may be a whole collection of them that sends it out in all sorts of different ways that I've wrapped together. All I care about is it has that method. I'm going to be able to call it, and I'm not going to run into any problems when I do try and call it. So what we're saying is that yeah, it's great. Pull apart these classes this way. And then, by depending on abstractions, interfaces, for, for instance, we can avoid tight coupling between the classes and actually get that kind of flexibility to wire them up in different ways and get more use out of each individual class. OK, so I've only mentioned, we've shown constructor injection, where we're passing those dependent objects in through the constructor. Um, there are other types of ways of injecting those dependencies, and I'm going to sort of briefly talk about those. Personally, I always try and use construction, constructor injection. I don't particularly like these other ways of doing it. So, um, and the great thing with constructor injection, essentially, is that it happens at the time, you know, you construct an object in that state, and you know that it's um, ready to be used, and that no one else is going to change it under you. Um, so one of those is property injection, which you may see, in a, um, which is essentially just simplifying it down to this. Um, so we don't have to, um, I guess it's when people don't want to worry about writing a constructor. You just say, I've got a public property that's a notifier. Um, get rid of the constructor and let anyone set it. So of course, the problem we've got with this is that um, we lose all that safety of type hints. Again, we're back to the point where anyone can set the notifier property to anything they want. Um, <coughs> um, so we could improve on that and say setter injection, which does get a bit more use, which um, essentially what we're doing here is saying that we're back to a private uh, property for the notifier, but we're using, instead of a construct method, a setter method that says, that looks the same as our constructor earlier, it's saying set notifier to an in-stock notifier, and then make use of it that way. So there's a problem with this, which is if we do this. So we're creating a new stock levels class, uh, object from the class, and then we're updating the stock levels. Um, 
but we've forgotten that if we're using setter injection, we do also need to call that setter method to give it the notifier. So if we run that without making other changes to the class, then we're going to find that we've got a null object. So the problem with using setter injection, well, setter injection is that you can kind of create the class or create an object from a class in an inconsistent way, so in a way where it can then fail in use. If we used a constructor injection, we wouldn't have got into that situation. And there's things you can do inside to make sure that's okay. You could say, okay, well, I only want to notify people. I don't always want to notify people, so I'm going to make it an optional dependency and then say, have I got an use an if statement to say, is there a notifier set on this property? If there is, call it. If not, don't. Um, so that's one of the kind of use cases for setter injection, but I don't, I wouldn't use it other than that, and even then I would consider using like a null implementation of a notifier, so we pass in a notifier that doesn't actually do anything, but as far as the stock levels class is concerned, it's exactly the same as if it had received one that did do something. Okay, so that's it kind of at a class level is all there is to it, but how it all works at an application level then does sort of change a bit and becomes interesting because part of the problem we have is, well not problem, but the kind of knock-on effect of this is that if we're taking all that creation of dependencies out of the individual classes, then it has to go somewhere. So whenever we, so we kind of had simple examples of, I would just call new this the new one of those, but as we go, we kind of find, well, if we do this to all our classes, so we only looked at stock levels before, but in the email in stock notifier, we're probably going to need to create, we want to inject its dependencies. Instead of saying new emailer, a new customer here, we could change that and say, actually, I want you to give me a customer repository, and I want you to give me an, e um, give me an emailer service, and then I'll make use of those um, properties rather than instantiating the time I use them. And then if in our emailer sort of class, well, we might want to make that an interface so we can switch between Swift Mailer and another mailer. So again, we introduce an emailer class, we've got Swift Mailer. We actually create the Swift Mailer object itself outside of that and pass it in, perhaps, rather than having that code in there to do the setting up and the new. And if we do the same with customers, we've got doctrine, customer repository, it's an implementation of customers, so we can swap it in and out again. And we create the we want to create the doctrine entity manager somewhere else and pass it in. So if we do all of this, it makes instantiating a stock levels class quite a bit more difficult. So it might be quite flexible, but if we want to create one, we need to, we might have all of this code. So we've got all that stuff saying here's the doctrine configuration, here's the doctrine con connection configuration. We've got our mail server, server port, username, password. We need to create an entity manager. We need to create a Swift mailer transport. We need to create a Swift mailer instance. And then we can start stitching all of this stuff together. So we can switch our new stock levels, our new email in stock notifier, customer repository. That has an entity manager and a Swift mailer thing, which takes a mailer. So it's starting to get quite complicated just to set up all of these classes. They might be nice and small and simple themselves, but because we've separated that, somewhere else in our application we now need to do all the object instantiation, do all of this sort of stuff, and then we can make use of it. And what creates the stock level object, because whatever's using that probably isn't going to want to do all of that code. We're probably going to want to actually create it, some push that up again, and inject, create it somewhere else and inject it into that object. So if we keep pushing all our dependencies up, then we find its dependencies all the way up, and they all kind of pop out the top of our application, and we need to kind of create them all somewhere, and then we can make use of it. So when we have, quite often with things like this, we've got, there are patterns that can help us deal with this. So um, there's design patterns for this sort of thing. So some of the ones that are around for construction that we could use, um, things like builders and factories, um, but nowadays, well, there's um, a more specific um, object sort of pattern that we can use, which is that uh, dependency injection container. So this is um, like a container or sort of specific object, or in the case of sort of Symphony's one, quite a lot, a collection of quite a lot of objects that work together 
to wire up all of our objects and then give it to us in this pre-wired state. You might also hear it called the service container in the Symphony world, um, because we kind of think of these sort of objects we're wiring up like our mailer is, and we call them <coughs> services. Unfortunately, service is a horribly overloaded word in software engineering, so in this case, when we talk about services, what we're talking about is those sort of objects we've seen pre-wired up that we can just make use of. Um, unfortunately, container is also quite an overloaded word now, particularly with sort of the Docker being all the rage, so this is a different use container to that, so um, yeah, it's slightly unfortunate naming. Um, and you may also see elsewhere, like people talking about IOC cont containers, which essentially is just the same thing. Um, so IOC here stands for inversion of control, and dependency injections like a specific um, way of achieving a bigger, the bigger concept of IOC. Uh, IOC. So the inversion of control is that we're taking away the control of deciding what to do from how to do it and pushing it outside. Um, dependency injection is a good way of doing that if you're doing object-oriented programming. So, um, in a small application, if you're writing just maybe like a little command line uh, tool or something like that, and you started like pulling your code apart in that kind of way, it may not, you may just be able to have, you've got a bootstrap file at the top, you don't mind writing a few, like stitching together a few new things. As that grows and it becomes unmanageable, um, it might be useful to introduce one of these containers. So one for sort of smaller and medium size applications we can use is Pimple. Um, so with Pimple, when we use it, it looks something like this. So this would be in our like a sort of bootstrap file. We could say, I want a new container, so it's a new Pimple. And then I'm gonna set my sort of services on that. So it has like array access style um, access, so we can say container stock levels is, and then tell it how to create stock levels objects. So we're kind of assigning like key style things to services so we can refer to them elsewhere. And then we're actually kind of doing, what it does is uses a, an anonymous function here to say, when I ask for this, actually then run this code. So we're gonna still do the same sort of thing and say a new stock levels thing, and ask the container to give us the stock um, notify email service and, inject, and create it with that. So the reason for using anonymous functions for this sort of thing is as your application grows, you may not want to instantiate every single object in it for every request or everything that you use it. So by wrapping it in anonymous functions in this way, we can just say only if I ask for that particular set of objects should you call that function and give them to me. So particularly if you've got any objects with the heavy to construct, it can be useful. So we'd have to create something similar for the next level down. So the stock notifier emailer, email is itself an anonymous function that asks for its dependencies from the container. And then we can kind of write that code for creating the Swift mail stuff in there. So it gives us a way of organizing it and it also defers the, the actual time at which you call new and do all of those and do that. Um, and it also means that the container can keep track of all those things by a config key rather than you creating kind of variables and having to refer back to that particular variable. So you could maybe then start to split this up across more than one file so you don't have to keep it all locally in local scope. You can kind of set up some of the container in one place, some of it in another place, um, and not end up with sort of one huge config file. Okay, so at some point we actually need to get something out of it and make use of it. So we might get a whole application or maybe a slightly le lower level once you've decided like which controller action's being run or which console command you're using. And um, we're gonna say, give me the whole of that code for that for this particular key and then I'm gonna do something with it. So at that point everything's all set up for us and then we actually start doing something and sending kind of our maybe console arguments or our HTTP request through the object graph. So the pimple's quite simple and easy to understand. Um, if you ignore the little bit of noise of the um, anonymous functions in there, then it's actually pretty similar to what we'd have written if we weren't using the container. If we do have lots and lots of configs and a larger application, um, 
And we probably don't want to write all of those sort of functions out. So, um, so in a larger application, we can make use of a Symfony service container. Or if you're using a Symfony full stack framework, then this is already there. It's going to come with some of its own services set up. Um, and then similar, I believe, in Drupal 8. So here we can use config files rather than writing code in order to actually configure the different services. Um, there's a couple of ways different things available to you. So you've got XML or YAML. I need use XML for the examples, mainly because it is more, more verbose, it's more explicit, you can see what's happening. With YAML, it, once you understand it, it's great and it cuts it all down, but you do kind of, um, it loses that explicit, you, know, so you need to know that when you put certain things in the array with a certain symbol in front of it, it means this. So. So in our XML file for services, we probably, uh, the simplest thing we can do is just define like a um, service like this. So we, again, we give it an ID. So this is similar to the pimples kind of array access keys. So we're saying we've got a stock level service with that ID and then the class is the actual PHP class here, stock levels. Um, you could use namespace classes in here and put out the, write out the full namespace. So we're saying to the container, when I ask for one of those, use new on that stock levels class and then give that back to me. Of course, we needed to have some arguments passed into that. Um, so our notify our email, so we can use the argument element to say, there's an argument for you, it's a service, and here's the ID. So this is another service, and when you find somewhere else, when you create a stock levels thing, go and find that service, create that, and inject it into me. So it will kind of recurse through all of these definitions. So our stock levels definition looks something, um, well, we could swap it. So if, so if that was with our email, if we wanted to use SMS, we could just at this point um, swap it for the SMS service instead. So that was that kind of, instead of doing it in the code, we're just changing an XML file external to the code. Okay, so um, what you'd probably find, so then, yeah, we can create more services at this level. So we're stitching together, we had our stock levels, our email in stock notifier, which takes the customer repository drop-in, and then email Swift mailer. That takes in this other service, it's the email Swift mail. So it's all pretty straightforward then. We will find, though, if we remember that to create a Swift mailer instance, so this wasn't the code we're written, it's from the library, but we did that through a static method. We called new instance and passed it with transport. So we can still do this um, with the service container, so it gets slightly more complicated now. We can have, say, as well as the class as a factory class of Swift mail and a factory method of new instance. So now the container will know that instead of calling new to create one of these objects, it will create, it will use Swift mail and new instance to create it. And what the container will do is keep track of all these objects as well. So it's not going to create a new one every time you ask for this. Each time it will say, have I already got one of these? If it has, have that back. If not, now I'll create it and keep track of it. So you effectively only ever get one instance of these, each instance of these services. So setting up the... Um, Swift mailer transport thing itself is a bit more complicated than that. So here we had various config values in our code, the mail server address, port number, the username and the password. And then we again used a static method and we also called some methods on it. So we, having got hold of the transport object, we called set username and we also called set password to set that up. So we can deal with the parameters by having a parameter section that's also supported in our config file. So the parameters, so we've got a key to give it a name that we can refer to and we set the value in there um, sort of statically and we can refer back to that in our service definition. So instead of saying our arguments are now another service, we're saying it's using these percent signs, it's the mail server variable, so it'll, the service container will refer back to that parameter and put it in for us. We could also just pass in static scalar values at this point, um, and you can also set PHP com, um, like constants out of PHP classes as well. We also needed to call those set username and set password methods on there, so and our, the service container can do this for us, so after we've put, um, said the constructor arguments we want to pass to it, we can also say 
um, here's some methods that we want to call. So here's the first method is set username, and here's the parameter that I want to pass to it, the mail username parameter. And then we can do the same for set password. Um, in this case, the parameters, you could just pass yet more services in there. So if you did want to use like setter injection, you can use this as a way of passing services into other services through, um, through setter methods. So the advantage of using like the Symfony service container is that we're assembling files from various places. So you can assemble your own files. The framework itself will provide them. So in fact, if you're using the Symfony framework, you wouldn't need to do all this stuff with SwiftMail. It's kind of taken care of for you and just opened up as a mailer service. So it reads in param your parameter files, uses those to create those services, and it's, all, it's there for you. Um, and the various sort of third-party bundles and things that you can add also provide yet more services into the container. So you can keep sort of finding pre-set up things and they'll expose ways of configuring them, passing different parameters, or you can over override the way it's done to stitch it up slightly differently. So you don't have to write all of this config, just the part, say, for your services. Um, what it does mean then is that we're kind of like assembling stuff from various parameter files, third-party bundles, the framework itself, and taking all those XML files and stitching it all together so that the container knows about all sorts of services. So one of the things it does do then is provide us with caching. Um, so the caching work, um, essentially all that gets turned into PHP code and it all gets dumped into one file so that every time you're kind of using the container firing up your application, it just reads in that cached file and not all those XML files and YAML files and any files and things that are scattered around the sort of file system because that would be quite a big performance hit there. So it turns it all into one big PHP file which loads pretty quickly and um, essentially just contains PHP that look quite like the stuff we saw at the start where we were just saying new this, new that all the way through. Okay, so how do we actually access services out of that? Um, we can call just the container has a getter method at the top. We can say container gets and give me a service by that service ID. So we want to get a whole application out of it or individual controllers um, or in a controller get individual services. But we should try and avoid as we get further down, like avoid doing that apart from when you have to right up at the top. So. And what I mean by this is inst um, instead of, we might end up and be tempted to, instead of writing code like this, where we've got the constructor passed in, uh, so the notified passing to constructor is to do something like this and say, I'm going to actually pass the container in, and then I'm going to get the service out of there. Um, and it's tempting to sort of do this, but what happens then is that you're creating a dependency not on a notifier anymore, but on a particular service container. So you can't use this code with a different service container, and we actually lose some of that kind of safety again because we're back to relying on the fact that the container was configured with um, something that implemented our in-stock notifier interface, um, but there's nothing inside this class that any any guarantees that anymore. Like anyone, if someone reconfigured the container, we could get anything out of there. So. I think it's just fine, it's, yeah, it's really helpful to try and remember that what you're doing is assembling these classes in a simple way. The container is there to help you put it all back together. It's not rather than something you should actually rely on in the code itself. <coughs> okay, so when? So when do we actually use dependency injection in this sort of way? Um, should we use it for everything and avoid constructing anything directly, ever seeing the new keyword, and just do it, putting everything together in this sort of way? Well, it's good for these sort of reusable, stateless sort of services. So, we, so um, email, it makes sense to pass in because we can use that over and over again. Once it's set up, we can send as many emails as we want for it, and it's not going to make any difference each time. It'll behave the same. There's no side effects of using it. 
Likewise, if it was something like a templating engine, so if we're using Twig for templating, once it's set up, we can render lots of templates with Twig, and we're not going to find that there's any problems doing that. It should be the same every time. Or a router service that generates URLs for us, for instance. So, but we do have other things like this in our sort of project, in our application. So if you've got values that represent things or entities, then each one of those is different. We don't want one for the whole application. We don't have one customer. We have lots of customers, hopefully. Um, so these are the sort of things we should create directly. So we should create an email message sort of directly, because each email message is different to the previous ones, and we'll still see new keywords perhaps for those. If it's a product, when we're creating it, product has identity based on its, on its SKU. It's not the same as, you know, we can't use one, re, have one reusable product object. Customer, same sort of thing. We may not use new, maybe we've got like a sort of named constructor that people quite like using nowadays. We're using a sort of static method to do that. So we're saying customer, register this. It's still creating a new instance each time. So. We're not going to use DI for everything, but I like to say for anything where it does make sense, that is that kind of configurable service that we're going to make use of, then I like to try and make sure it's used for everything and push everything right up, right out of our application and configure it to somewhere else. Because as soon as we're not doing that, we're kind of tying ourselves into specific implementations. Okay, and when should we use a container? So. If you're writing a small app that's growing, when it becomes too difficult to manage those dependencies directly. So whilst you've still only got like a small amount that you can kind of keep on screen and keep track of, there's no need to introduce the complexity of um, using a dependency injection container. Once it starts to grow and become unwieldy, and you don't want to create everything every time, and you want to be able to split up into lots of different files, um, and configure them separately, then it makes sense to start using a container. And the other thing, time, of course, is if you're using a frame, if you're using a full stack framework like Symfony or you're using something like uh, Drupal 8, which will use the Symfony service container, then the container's already going to be there. It's already providing services for, for you. So you could use it in the way that I was saying you should try and avoid and say, okay, oh, give me the container, give me a service. Or you can create your own classes that make use of those services and tell the service container how to create them using those sort of services that are already there for you. So you tell it that you want to use a mail server, mail service, rather than saying, hey, give me the mail the service out of the container. So I mean, the main things for me is the kind of the very important about dependency injection, are, but it's, it is very simple, really. As a pattern for creating objects, there's not very much to it, really. But you should use constructor injection where possible. Use, you can use setter injection, property injection, things like this, but you lose some of the type safety um, document, documentation you get from using type hints, and you also um, get this potential for objects to end up in inconsistent states. And it also means you know that once it's constructed, it stays the same. If you're using something like setter injection, then some other bit of code in your application can change those dependencies under you, and you might call it at one point and then call it again and find that the behavior has changed in between. Constructor injection gives you like a form of immutability that means that once you set your services up how you want them to be set up, they'll stay set up that way for that request. And the other thing is that containers, yeah, as I was saying, it was uh, for assembling code only. They're not there to be kind of used throughout the application. They're there to help you with a specific problem of how you put all those objects back together. Okay. So that's um, what I've got to say today, so thank you. Um, I'll have time for questions in a minute. I just need to say a couple of things, which was to promote the sprints on Friday. So... Um, and I also need to say that so um, ICOS, which is a, sort of like a sister company of um, Sensio Labs UK now, we're both part of the same group, is running beers at the booth with, at Lingo Tech, along with Lingo Tech at their booth tomorrow afternoon at half three, so that's at booth 303. 
where there'll be free drinks and snacks. Um, okay, and uh, yeah, you can evaluate this session um, at this URL here. Okay, cool. So, does anyone have any questions at all? Yes. Uh, yes, so the question was, um, can you use dependency injection in legacy applications and wrap them in that? So, yes, you can certainly introduce it, and there's certain things you can do. So, because you can, you can still create your instances of objects of the legacy code, it might be that then underneath them they create their own, but you can kind of, you could create the higher level objects in the container, and start to work with it that way rather than you don't have to go full, you know, whole scale, get everything out and inject it back in. And once, but once you're getting the kind of higher level objects out of the container, you can then start to refactor those in a way that the rest of the code doesn't necessarily know about it, just knows it gets one of those, an instance of your legacy object and can start using it. Um, so in your new code, you could start using it there. You could also, can start to, I mean, I wouldn't do it with new code, but you could do things like wrap kind of a way of having static access to the container into your legacy code so you can sort of pull dependencies out of it at different points in that, even though you haven't refactored the whole thing to use dependency injection. Is that okay? Cool. Anyone else? Yeah, well, thank you.